Greetings, everyone. I'm Steve Clements. I'm editor at large at The Hill. I consider myself part of the INET family. It's always an honor to engage in consequential conversations that deal with the crossover of economics and society, what we're getting, what we deserve, all of these issues. And we have a US China and a kind of a China in the world um, aperture to, to look at today. Um, we've had two really great panels so far, and this is the final one uh, of this program. Uh, called Towards a Constructive Path Forward. Um, I, I really want to thank the last panel for helping to lay out so much of this and the first panel that we had that laid out, you know, a lot of what's wrong. Now let's see where we can, what we can do with it today. And today we have really fascinating lineup of people. We have Justin Yifu Lin, Lin Dean, of the, uh, Dean, Professor and Honorary Dean in the National School of Development at Peking University. Um, I also want to say that he's also Dean of the Institute of New Structural Economies uh, and, and the Institute of the South uh, at Peking University. Um, we were just discussing this before in our green room and really look forward to what the building blocks of development and opportunity are out there. We also have Danny Roderick, president of the International Economic Association, uh, and of course, the Ford Foundation professor of international political economy at the JFK School of Government at Harvard University. We have Michael Spence, who is great friend. He's, he, was vice, uh, he was chairman of the Independent Committee on Growth and Development uh, Committee, and he was also uh, worked with Vaccinating the World. He is uh, a Nobel laureate, of course, uh, and a great friend of, of INET. Uh, and finally, we have Adair Turner, who is chair of the Energy Transitions Committee, uh, former chair of the UK Financial Services Authority. Adair has written so compellingly about uh, debt out there, but he was more importantly also the former chairman of INET, and he's a great friend, and it's great uh, to be with you all. Um, I'm going to ask each of our people to speak for a few minutes to offer their portal into this question of uh, globalization uh, and U.S.-China uh, issues and what we do, where we go from here, and just give each a few minutes, and then we're going to engage in conversation. I want to tell our audience that you can post your questions, as you have in your other panel, in our chat area, and you can begin doing that now, and we'll try not to just leave it to the end. We'll try and weave these questions in as part of our conversation uh, and the roundtable that we have. So let me ask Michael Spence to go first and help lay the stage for what our challenge is. Michael? Michael, you're muted, my friend. You need to unmute. Hopeless for several thousand of us. We don't, or I don't. It's nice to be with you and known for years and enormously. Um, the previous two. So, Michael, we have a sound respect. problem with you that I'm going to yes. ask our team to help work out with you to come back because it's not oh. coming through correctly. So let's, uh, we'll come back to you, Michael. You are. And we're going to come back. So if I'll ask Claire Novak to help it, let me go to, to Adair Turner. And Adair, ask you to help set the stage for what we need to do as we're trying to get Michael there. And I want to ask our other uh, participants on this panel for the time being to mute your uh, mics while we're talking because we're getting the feedback and that may be what's causing the problem. But Adair, the floor is yours. Steve, can you hear me? And you can yes, hear me yes. correctly. <clears throat> okay, good. Well, look, um, R Rob uh, Johnson asked me to join this session. I, I was uh, on a meeting earlier and I couldn't come right at the beginning, though I have been listening for the last hour to that very good discussion. Uh, and I'm going to make comments which really are about climate change and what we can do uh, to uh, carve out climate change or can we carve out climate change from the tensions of the uh, rest of the relationship between the US and China uh, in particular. Right. And I talk as the chair of something called the Energy Transition Commission, which is a global coalition, which is very active in China, as well as across the world. And I also, I feel I ought to declare an interest. Uh, I, I have a commercial relationship with one of China's biggest uh, wind turbine manufacturers, uh, which is also the owner of a Japanese battery a company, uh, which also has battery factories uh, in the UK and France and uh, the US. So we are quite at the center of some of these issues about supply chains and technological competition, uh, etc. Um, clearly, over the last year, between 
China and the US. There have been major steps forward in commitments uh, on climate change. Xi Jinping's commitment last September at the UN to get to net zero by 2060. Uh, Biden's uh, commitment, and the Chinese will remind you that it came later, uh, that the uh, Chinese commitment was at a time uh, when America was still had as its president a climate change denier, but Biden's commitment to net zero by 2050 as well. Those are good steps forward, uh, but we have to have concerns that they will not be enough. Uh, in China's case, uh, I very strongly believe that they should make a commitment to be at zero by 2050, not <laughs> 2060, and should peak emissions earlier. Um, and that is the big debate. Frankly, in the US, uh, the big debate is, will this commitment last or would it disappear with a Republican administration if one was elected in four years time? So we have made step forwards on climate change, but in both China and the US, there are concerns. So it would be great if these two major powers could agree to make more progress on climate change, even if they... Uh, do not agree on many other issues. And in personal terms, you would have thought we have a better opportunity to do that than you could, uh, than you could hope for, which is that John Kerry, uh, Biden's uh, chief uh, international climate envoy, uh, and Xi Shenhua, uh, the chief climate negotiator of China, are good old colleagues who know each other well, who get on personally, uh, who have a relation going back uh, to Copenhagen. So you might hope that this is an environment uh, where you could make a progress which carves it out uh, from the wider attentions. But I have to say, I think that is unlikely to occur. I mean, John Kerry has recently been urging the Chinese to up their commitment before COP26 in Glasgow, uh, but has not been met uh, with any uh, a favorable uh, response. And I think there is an unwillingness to carve it out. I think there is a price in which they would uh, carve it out, um, and a, uh, but that would be a price America will not do. I think if uh, uh, America shut up out about Xinjiang, uh, Hong Kong, and Taiwan, you might have a different environment, but America is not going to do that. So I think, frankly, we are in a very difficult position on the carve-out philosophy. And that is problematic because one of the ways that we make progress in the world is step-by-step -step reciprocity. Uh, I will do something if you do something, and then we both do more than we originally intended. So this is a very difficult environment. The good news is that I think it is almost certainly the case that China is going to do lots more than it has already committed to on a unilateral basis and almost deliberately not allowing that to be seen as part of international diplomacy. Um, I don't think there'll be any tightening of their position at COP26. There may be, and that would be very uh, welcome. But I suspect that we are going to see China progressing faster on a emissions reductions uh, than they have committed to, because it makes sense for them domestically, because they are a leader in all of the technologies, whether it's uh, batteries, hydrogen, electrolysis, uh, because they have individual companies who are now committed to going much faster. Uh, only a month after Xi Jinping said China would be 2060 by, uh, would be net zero by 2060, Baowu Steel, which is the biggest steel company in the world, said we will be net zero by 2050. And they are technological mm. drivers on how to get there. It is also the case that one of the biggest things China can do to drive down its emissions right. is to achieve the rebalance of its economy, which it needs to achieve in any case, away from a construction focused economy with excessive use of steel and uh, cement. So I suspect we will see unilateral Chinese action rather than right. reciprocal. But to end with, what could we do which would help here? I think one thing that we can do is to end up and this somewhat relates to what Martin Wolf suggested <coughs> earlier, with not overstating the challenges, not seeing problems where they don't exist. China is a leader in solar PV. It is a leader in batteries. It is now a leader in electrolysis. 
But the fact that China is a leader of those is not a national security threat uh, to America because you don't fight wars with solar PV uh, or with hydrogen electrolyzers. Yes, other countries should seek to develop those technologies as well. But I think mm -hmm. it is quite possible to have a, uh, a favorable competition, a competition of trying each to go as fast as possible on these technologies without ending up with a paranoid belief that somehow China's current leadership uh, in these technologies is a threat to the West. That is my one idea of something which would help us go beyond a unilateral set of commitments in an environment where I think for now, the process of reciprocal commitments through diplomacy is going to continue to be quite difficult to achieve. All right. Well, Adair, thank you so much for those great framing comments and uh, setting a platform for us to go further. Let me try to come back to Michael Spence and let me ask everyone to mute their line so that we can hopefully hear Michael. So if you can mute, hopefully this will work. Michael, the floor is yours. Thank you. Does this sound now? Can you hear me? So, Michael, I'm going to ask the, 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 the team to um, take you off and bring you back in. So if you can leave the room and come back in, I think that may help solve the problem. Okay. Thank you so much. Danny Roderick, if you would unmute and join us and share your thoughts, and then we'll go to Justin. Yes, I hope uh, you can you can hear me fine. Um, uh, uh, the um, the the tough thing that I think we need to uh, figure out conceptually is how we design a regime that is going to be uh, cognizant of the fact that there are lots of areas where there's not going to be agreement, whereas there are lots of areas that are where there are some mutually beneficial bargains uh, that can be struck, um, and. Um, and that, I think it's, it's, it's in principle, it's quite possible to envisage a world which remains definitely bipolar, uh, but it's bipolar in a very benign kind of a way. Uh, I have a very is, high speed internet connection. Um, we need to take Michael off of the uh, platform, folks, because we're getting feedback. So please take Michael off the platform and bring him in muted. Thank you very much. Go ahead, Danny. So in this benign bipolar world, um, the United States and China would uh, understand um, uh, that they will continue to compete on a number of fronts. Um, they will uh, continue to trade and invest in each other's economies. Very important, they will not challenge the le legitimacy of each other's domestic systems. Um, cooperate where interests are aligned, uh, but also um, uh, observe certain kinds of rules of the roads where there are um, inevitable clash of interests. Um, recently, um, uh, Steve Walt, my uh, international relations um, colleague at the Kennedy School and I uh, wrote a, a paper um, where we tried to sketch out a, a kind of a vision, um, which we call a kind of a meta regime uh, that might achieve um, something along these lines, um, where we simultaneously try to avoid the um, the adverse consequences of a security dilemma um, that could devolve into hot conflict, as well as on the economics front, um, avoid problems of um, global public goods not being paid for and uh, beggar thy neighbor policies becoming the norm. Um, we argue in this in this paper that um, uh, it is possible to establish uh, to uh, envisage such a world or such a meta regime, and the way that we think of this meta regime is essentially uh, as a device for structuring a conversation uh, around relevant <coughs> and facilitating either agreement or accommodation, uh, as the case might be, and. Uh, such a regime would be actually very agnostic or open-ended about what the specific rules that would be pursued or applied in particular areas. 
So there's a, a you know, the way we describe it is there's a kind of a, a threshold condition that uh, US and China, China would have to agree uh, that you know, they would need to agree that it's desirable to classify different issues uh, into, let's say, three different domains um, we, without having to agree on um, in advance on which actions or which issue belongs to each category. So what are these three domains? These domains would be, let's say, bucket one or category one would be actions that would be simply prohibited uh, because uh, both parties agree these are actions that are illegitimate or wrong uh, and that contra contravene principles that uh, both are willing to accept. Um, these would be essentially harms that would be imposed on one party on the, on the other that cannot plausibly be justified by either economic or national security considerations. So this would be the prohibited uh, category. Um, there would be a second category where um, essentially there would be significant difference of whether a particular action is legitimate or not. Uh, so it would not enter into the prohibited category, but for which there might still be positive some positions, positive sum solutions uh, could still be possible. For example, if state A adopts a policy that is harmful to state B, uh, the two parties may still be able to negotiate a mutually beneficial bargain that leaves both better off. Uh, such a bargain might involve, for example, state B offering a concession in another domain in return for state A revoking uh, the harmful policy. So this would be a category, the second category is where uh, there is room for mutual adjustment and mutual uh, bargaining. Then this third category would be, um, if you will, a category of autonomous action or independent action, where um, such mutual adjustment as in category two proves impossible, and each state uh, does resort to its in, you know, own independent policy actions. Um, the key requirement here, and this is the key point really, is that even when there are when there is a disagreement, there is agreement on how that disagreement then plays out. So in this category, essentially, uh, even though each uh, state goes its own way, uh, they are free to adopt national actions, however, that have to be well calibrated. Um, so the key idea here is that of well calibrated, and what that means is that this individual autonomous actions have to be clearly linked to the damage being done by the other side's policies and intended solely to mitigate uh, its negative right. effect. In particular, such countervailing policy responses should not be right. undertaken for the express purpose of punishing the other side or weakening it in the long run, uh, nor should the failure to reach an acceptable compromise in one area be used as a pretext to retaliate in a different and unrelated domain. So this idea that many people right. have mentioned, which is to ensure that disagreements in one domain don't contaminate and spill over into uh, becoming problems in other domains as well. So, of course, we do not expect that US and China will start out with an acceptance as to where each policy issue belongs. But I think the process of getting into a conversation where you're trying to determine um, where uh, um, uh, where each issue belongs right. can serve a useful function is in, in so far as it encourages each party uh, to explain their actions, right. uh, to clarify their motives, and to justify their decisions. And I think this kind of a mutual explanation, clarification, in terms of trying to uh, classify actions according to one of these categories is a right. fundamental building block for uh, building trust that might um, uh, um, uh, 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 accumulate over the, over over time. And this meta regime can essentially, yeah. over time, can help bootstrap right. the level of yeah. cooperation that might not have occurred uh, otherwise. So uh, we we. Uh, try to apply this way of thinking in specific policy domains, whether it is um, high-tech economic policy, whether it is um, 
uh, conflicts, uh, uh, regional conflicts, um, and there are sort of more discussion about that in the, right. in the paper that's on, on my uh, website with uh, Steve Walt, as I mentioned. Uh, so, but I think it is possible right. to envisage a meta regime, a, 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 a kind of a structured conversation uh, that has the capacity uh, to clarify areas where there's agreement, where there's disagreement, and where there's disagreement uh, to um, uh, to uh, enable a kind of well-calibrated set of responses that don't result um, in, uh, in, 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 in conflict uh, escalating. So well, thank you. Um, thank you, Danny. Um, We're going to have to leave it there because we've got very little time for this session. We've got to bring in Justin and Michael. But I'll just say in response, just very quickly, listening both to Adair and to you, Danny, you know, the thing in the back of my mind is the Cold War. <clears throat> you know, when we had the, the, the fear and possibility of a thermonuclear exchange, it created uh, pathways for partnership or, <laughs> or po uh, po possibly together. So I want to come back to that when we get the discussion. Again, tell our audience that you can post your questions in the chat function to the right of your screen. We'd love to have them. Uh, and I'm now going to come to Justin, and then we'll go to Michael uh, Spence, who I know is back with us. So Justin Yifu Lin. Justin? Well, thank you very much. Can you hear me well? Yes. Okay, very good. So let me offer some Chinese perspective because I'm the only Chinese in the session. And the first one I'd like to make is that I'd like to use this occasion to explain China's aspiration. And China's aspiration has been laid out in the 19th Party Congress in 2017. The aspiration, the first one, it's for China to become a modern country by the time of 2035. And uh, for China to become an advanced country by the time of 2049 at the you know, 100th anniversary of the founding of the People's Republic. And uh, this year, you know, when China adopts the 14th 14th five-year plans and a 2035 long-term visions. China further clarify what do we mean by a modern country by 2035. That is to double the GDP on the basis of 2020. And that means China hope to reach per capita GDP of around 22,000 US dollars to 23,000 US dollars by the time of 2035. And for that, China need to maintain 4.7% 4. 4. growth and above. Right. And also China hope to become an advanced country by the time of 2049. That means China would like to have a per capita GDP of half of the US by that time. Just like Korea now has a per capita GDP of the US and China like to reach that status by the time of 2045. And that means China would have to maintain about 4% growth from 2036 to 2049. And you know, I think that most likely China will be able to achieve those kind of aspirations because if China wants to raise income, that means China need to maintain growth. And for growth, China needs to have a continuous technological innovation, industrial upgrading. And China has two advantages of that. The first one certainly is the late commerce advantages. China is still only catching up process in many sectors. And the second one, in the fourth industrialization, like the digital, big data, artificial intelligence. For those kind of new industries, it has a nature of short cycle innovation and heavily rely on human capital. China is a large country with a lot of talent. So China can compete in that kind of new industrial revolutions. And with these two advantages, I think unless we have a nuclear conflict between US and China, otherwise the growth in China is unstable. Un unstoppable. That's my first point. 
And as I so come Justin, point, if I that's mentioned. your first point, I'm just going to tell you, we, we're already at 6.30, or we're already in my time, 6.30, so we're halfway through and we need to bring in questions. So I'm just going to ask people to give a digested version of their thoughts or we're not going to get to our audience. So just, just need to be uh, upfront about that. Thank you. So go ahead. Okay. The second one, China has no territory ambition. China's ambition, China's aspiration is mainly economically. Because if you look historically, China has... China was the major power in East Asia for a thousand years, but China did not take any colonies. And in modern times, after the founding of People's Republics, China engaged in three worlds. One is Korean War in 1950 to 53. The second one is China India War in 1962. The third one, China Vietnam War in 1979. But every time when the war was over, China withdrew all the troops back to the Chinese border. China did not take any territory. And I think that will be still true. And uh, just like Mahathir was warned about the rising power of China, may threat Mahathir. Mahathir of Malaysia replied, China has been our neighbors for more than 2,000 years. And his China still our friendly neighbors. But when the West visit us in two years, we were colonized. So right. what the second point I'd like to mention, the West should not use its own historical pattern to predict what China is going to do. China is China. China is not West. And China has no territory ambition. The third one that means China will continue to rise in its income Certainly, that means China's industrial will continue to upgrade. So China will have more and more industry to compete with the industry in the advanced country. Just like when US was catching up with the Britain in the late 19th century and early 20th century, that happened between the US and, uh, uh, and the UK. And uh, in the post-World War II, when Japan and uh, Germany you know, caught up with the U.S., certainly there was some energy going to compete. Those kind of things are going to happen. But at the same time, China not only exporting goods to compete, China also import a lot of goods. For example, last year, China export 2.6 trillion U.S. dollars, but China also import 2.5 billion dollars, uh, a trillion U.S. dollars. So trade is basically balanced. So we not only need to look into the competition that the US or other advanced countries faced from China. We also need to see the growth in China is an opportunity <clears throat> for everyone. And when China reaches the same advancement stage as the advanced country, we know that trade basically based on the principle of specialization as Paul Krugman's theory tell us. So I would say overall, when China grow, it's mainly an opportunity instead of a threat to the other country. And so let me conclude. When I studied in Chicago, I was taught development is a human right. And I hope this principle still being taught in the US. Development is a human right. And China certainly has a human right. And secondly, since I was a primary school students, I was taught about the spirit of the US Constitution. Men are born equal. And I hope the principle is still being uphold, upheld in the US. Men are born equal. And China, Chinese men is also men. And so Chinese men should be treated as equal as men from any other country. And a third one that come to, you know, the Adele's, you know, uh, right. talk about the climate changes. We are facing so many challenges in the whole world, and we need to have corporations. And I think that to have a cooperation between U.S. and China would be very important for us to cope with the challenge of the humanity. And uh, if we can work together, we can have a better future. If we cannot work together, unless we have nuclear war, China will continue to grow. So let me stop here. Well, thank you, Justin. I really appreciate you giving 
you know, a really a very different view than than where we started with the Dare Turner, who saw some of these dynamics in a very different different uh, dimension. We're going to get between them and between them. Danny Roderick really provided a very um, elegant and interesting uh, game theoretic set of options that could be that you look at in terms of how you build out of this. So we've got both views, you know, frankly, of a c contending issue. And our, our job today is to find our way out of this and to build forward where where can we go to take the realities that we're at and kind of build it. So I'm going to give all of that responsibility to Michael Spence. So Michael, <laughs> can you sew all this up? <clears throat> all right. Well, let me try again. Can you hear me now? Per perfectly. Thank you. Very good. Perfect. All right. Okay. Well, you know, the, the, those are a lot of very interesting comments. So I, you know, let, let, let me make a, a couple of observations and try not to use up too much time. You know, I think Danny's right. The mechanisms really matter. And, you know, and attention to building mechanisms, you know, that can be used. These are institutions for solving problems is really quite important and probably underemphasized. Um, I, I know from, you know, the late Tom Schelling was my thesis advisor and a very important person in the, in the sort of establishing the sort of incentive structures in the Cold War. And one of the things I learned from him is there was a rather relatively unknown entity in Vienna, Austria, which was the location where the major nuclear powers met and learned and, you know, and, and negotiated, talked and learned essentially how to manage nuclear weapons. And when a new nuclear power arrived, you know, they, they were invited essentially to join this discussion. It was completely, you know, below the radar. You didn't have, you know, journalists cycling around talking about it. I, I don't know if that's a great example, but I do know that, you know, that danger starts to, ar to rise if you don't have practical mechanisms, even if they're rather quiet um, for getting on with it. Steve, let me just say my perspective. I think that the reason we're in this situation is partly a bunch of mistakes have been made, but mainly because China is, a, is, a, is now a very powerful con country. I agree with everything Justin just said. It's, it's going to be, its growth is not gonna be disrupted uh, with any high likelihood. It will be economically and in other ways very powerful. I think in that context, you know, having having emerged from a world in which we had a a Cold War and b a kind of dominant United States, we're kind of you know on a learning curve, learning to live in a world where power is distributed uh, much more widely, and and I don't think we've kind of figured that out. But I, what I'm quite sure of, um, so I'll just say it, maybe somebody will want to talk about it, is I think the only stable configuration is some kind of balance of power. You can't just rely on trust. You know, both countries are going to have to have enough oomph uh, in order to defend their interests if it becomes necessary. And that plus building trust over time, I think, you know, can lead to a pretty stable situation. Anything else I think is, uh, has, you know, high degrees of instability kind of built into it. Having said that, you know, I want to end on an optimistic note. I do, there is no evidence that I've seen that China is uh, externally aggressive, as Justin said. Um, nor is there any evidence thus far that China is interested in ex exporting their governance model. They're quite attached to it themselves, you know, but I, I don't see any. So this is quite unlike the uh, former Soviet Union, uh, the, at least the ide ideology uh, of that. On the American side, you know, we could probably be accused of having wanting, wanted to export our governance model, <laughs> at least to some extent. And maybe we should just back off from that, you know, because it's not going to work, uh, at least in some parts of the world. And, you know, I won't get into kind of trends and whatnot's going on in the world. Um, and then I, then I think, you know, if you, if you, and, and balance of power it has another dimension, Steve. I, I, I'll mention it quickly. And that is, you know, if you have reasonably sane adults, men and women running the show, the, the consequences of, you know, either mistakes or accidents or letting things get out of hand are really quite dramatically bad, right? This is what balance of power really means, right? We didn't use nuclear weapons, but we didn't get into fights terribly often either. 
I mean, I think it's really, that's the world we're going to live in. We just need adults, you know, uh, making rational choices with, uh, with safety mechanisms built in. And then well, if we get, oh, if we manage to get there, then I'll, then I'll just say it. Then, I, then I think, you know, the, 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 the thing that Adair talked about, which is this, you know, one of a long list of things where cooperation is probably, you know, not only useful, but crucial, um, can come over time to dominate the agenda. So we'll stop there. Well, thank you very much, Michael, and thank you to all of you. And I'd like to just get a little conversation going. And again, I'll remind people that the message counter is open. So um, share your, your thoughts with us and be happy to post them to our panel. Um, but Adair and, and Danny, let me come back to you with, with the challenge here. Um, I think part of the challenge is, and, and I guess the question to Adair, who, who defined this in terms of the challenges of climate at this moment, of whether or not, you know, it was sort of going back to, well, maybe, maybe you know, it, it's not a G0 zero world like Ian Bremmer said, but we have a G2 world. If we have the G2 world kind of follow along the lines that both um, Justin and Michael Spence talked about, two big powers each have their systems and they sort of stalemate. That doesn't solve the problem to climate, right? That actually assures we have a disaster. And I'm just, as, again, coming back to listening to Danny, thermonuclear war and the possibility of it were in my head. Is the problem that a lot of people aren't scared enough about the climate realities we're in, Adair? That may be part of it, but I, I also think that we allow um, myths about competition to get in the way. Mm -hmm. So I absolutely completely agree with Justin Lin that the growth of China to be by 2049 um, a fully developed rich economy is pretty much unstoppable unless there it is a catastrophic nuclear war. And I don't think that growth in prosperity of China is any threat to the rest of the world, because I don't think the economy is a zero sum game. And I do think part of the problem here is that there is within America a rhetoric which just sort of can't sort of psychologically accept that by 2050 or 2049, China will be, and as Justin said, half the GDP per capita of America, but if it's half the GDP per capita of America, it will be twice the GDP. And there is part of the problem here is an American problem of just getting used to the idea that there can be another economy, which because of its numbers is going to be much bigger. My belief is that if China is going to be a fully developed rich economy by 2050, it fully, should be a fully developed rich zero carbon economy, that we need right. all successful advanced economies to get to zero carbon by 2050 with poorer, less successful economies beyond that. But I think we could carve out and we should try to carve out everything to do with trade and flows of investment in all the technologies which are required uh, to drive us towards a zero carbon economy from other forms of competition. That can still leave it appropriate for India to say, I want to take conscious steps to develop a value chain in solar PV and electrolyzers rather than being totally reliant on China. It can still mean that the US should say, yes, I want to make sure that there are some batteries uh, built in, uh, in the US uh, as well as in China, as there indeed there already are. But it should be relaxed about them being built by Chinese companies or there being trade flows between the two. Because what one does in this trade area is that there is a paranoia. Um, there is uh, national security arguments deployed in areas of the economy where they are irrelevant. So I would like to try and sort of carve this out. And part of it, as you say, Steve, is we do have to convince people, those who are not yet convinced, that this is so important uh, that it's worth doing that carve out. Well, thank you. And Danny, I'd love to get your thoughts on this. But, you know, in addition to, to telling me where I'm wrong on the, the, the metaphor of, of war, which Tom Schelling and others used to think about, I'm interested when you talk about the autonomous actor option, 
you know, what the limits of that. So I've been studying the European proposals, for instance, on border adjustability taxes and, and, and how important that is. And the outlier in that may very well be the United States, could be China. But I mean, at some point, you have to figure out how to do that, or you're going to have places that you know, high levels of fossil fuel embedded widgets are going to all end up somewhere trying to escape that border, that, that those border costs and, and the production of them. So I'm interested in both your thoughts on what are the big, scary things out there that drive positive sum solutions and going to your comments on, 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 on autonomous uh, choices and autonomous actors, if that doesn't work, you know, what are some of those well, you know, correlated uh, uh, well-calibrated dimensions that might apply in the climate case? Yes, I mean, I, I think um, uh, I agree with the, with the previous uh, speakers. And I mean, I think, you know, the first thing to understand is that, that we cannot go back to the, you know, um, you know pre-pandemic or if you will, pre-Trump, uh, uh, understanding of the kind of uh, world economy we're trying to build, which was um, essentially embedded in the uh, WTO um, and in, in sort of a network of bilateral and regional trade uh, uh, agreements, which which presumed that um, that countries like China would eventually converge to some U.S. or Western understanding of what a market economy is. Um, ads filtered through the eyes of uh, sort of commercial and, and investor um, um, uh, sentiment. So I think there is, I agreed in particular that, that you know, China's economy and China's economic development and China's economic strategies do not pose fundamental um, uh, uh, challenges to um, the economic interests of the West or the United States in particular. Um, and I think that's it, it's very important to start by framing what US economic interests, for example, are. You're going to get a very different um, picture uh, depending on whether your understanding of US economic interests is shaped by the so-called, you know, you know, foreign policy blob in Washington, or whether it's the you know the military industrial complex, or whether it is the you know the trade and investment uh, and business community in the United States, or it is um, you know workers in the Rust Belt or in in areas of the United States that have been left behind by uh, economic gains. These are sort of very different groups, um, and I think the problem is is for too long the U.S. Um, approach to um, China has been driven by a set of narrow trade um, and business interests uh, that viewed uh, essentially um, you know you know China opening up to US uh, businesses um, and, and US investment um, as essentially the key driver in this at least the economic part of the relationship now if we broaden the conception US conception of what US national economic interest is, there's absolutely nothing wrong with letting China pursue its own industrial policies. And, and let's not forget that this was, you know, China's industrial policies that brought us to, you know, the price of uh, solar energy where it is today. Um, and, and, and that, you know, is a policy of subsidization and industrial policy, which had China been you know, a, a lot to have been forced to play by the rules of the WTO, by the rules that the United States wanted them to play with. It's a point that we would not have reached today. Now, that's actually a great example of how autonomous action on the part of China for their own perceived interest has actually sort of had huge positive benefits for the world as a whole. And yet, you know, I think the West would have, you know, sort of had it had its, its, its way would have sort of managed to prevent. So I think let's focus on those areas where the, um, the, the problems are real severe and do threaten um, uh, 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 real national economic interests. For example, if there is something wrong with Huawei and its investments um, in the West that significantly threatens to undermine the integrity of communication systems and national security, uh, let's Western countries and the U.S. that keep Huawei out 
because it's a fundamental national economic interest. But that should not allow the US, for example, to try to keep Huawei from all out of all third markets from Africa or from the markets of you know, Europe where other nations don't have similar concerns. So I think the kind of framework I was laying out before is one where which would allow countries to explain what they're doing for fundamental national security and economic interests, uh, but would not allow them to to basically um, internationalize their policies, to apply their reasoning or their values or their, their preferences necessarily to other countries as well. I think the United States will have to learn how to act like that. But also by the same token, I would say that China will have to learn that it's going to face countries that are trying to maintain um, right. their labor markets. They're trying to maintain the integrity of their communication systems, national security, that yeah. often fundamentally and really believe in human rights and therefore right. are concerned about certain things that are happening in Xinjiang and, and other parts. Um, and, and so there is, I think that accommodation is needed on both sides. Well, thank you for that. And Justin, as you as you respond, because we're just we're running out of time. And so we've got to figure out how to weave in our audience. I'm going to weave in our audience and ask you to comment. But we've got we've just got about 10 minutes. So um, do you think competition for resources like rare earth minerals needed to green the economy could heighten global tensions between the US and China? And this is really the zero sum question. And I think, you know, that Danny was getting into that some some as well. You know, if if, if we have you know, battles over communications, you know, how are we going to manage it? I'd just be interested in to what, do, and if you listen to, let me just say, Catherine Tai, the U.S. trade representative, if you heard her last week, she's nowhere near close to your view or most of the views in the discussion here. There's a fairly pretty strident worry as expressed by the Biden administration about Chinese predatory economic behavior. Now, Dean Baker earlier today said that that's because of intellectual property and because those monopolies that want to protect themselves are worried about them. This is not about workers or the economy, but we'll just leave that there. I'd just love to see what you see as the potential bridges that might neutralize some of this obvious hostility. Justin? I think that uh, competition should be good. I have been taught that principle in Chicago throughout my whole years. Mm. And uh, secondly, if there's some disagreement, the better way is to go through multilateral institutional tribunal. And uh, certainly, you know, so if you have some doubt about the policy in China, it's not to put on sanction on China, but go to the international tribunal, but then to judge whether mm -hmm you know, the policy in China is appropriate. Travel policy in China is consistent with the policy in other country. You know, I think that would be the better way. And so overall, I, I signed a statement by Danny about the mechanism that he just, you know, uh, uh, discussed. And I fully endorse that. You know, it's a much better way to you know, deal with this kind of disagreement through dialogue, through mm -hmm. the rule-based multilateral uh, institutional tribunal system. Thank you. Michael, I'm going to jump to you and again, bring another <clears throat> question from our audience into whatever you'd like to say as we're looking forward. And the question is connecting back to the first session of today, which, which we did, could, could the panelists, can you reflect on the extent to which bilateral competition is driven by a winner takes all game of monopoly capitalism to which both countries seem to be committed. Michael? You're uh, muted, Michael. It's not my best day. Um, <laughs> there's probably people that see the world that way, but that wouldn't include any of us, I don't think. I mean, you know, I think Adair said it, Clearly, I mean, you know, economics is not a zero sum game flat out. Right. And uh, and and so framing it in that form, you know, is, I think, a huge mistake. You asked earlier in addressing just and, you know, what would happen to sort of highly concentrated, very critical things like rare earths? 
And my answer to that is if we, if we go down the road of deploying that, you know, as a kind of strategy to contain the other party, A, it will fail, and B, it will take us in exactly the wrong direction. I mean, so, you know, item three, you know, when the two presidents get together would be to sort of figure out the things they're not, you know, have a, a sort of negative to-do list you know, that, you know, just starts to cause, you know, cause an escalation and take you down. And, and we've all said it in one way or another, you know, any strategy that's designed to hold China down, it will fail. I mean, mm. it's just going to fail. So if we can sort of get rid of that idea and then move on to the subtler stuff that Danny is talking about, well, you know, how do we manage tensions and through what mechanisms? Well, everybody's talked about it. I think that's the way to go. Well, thank you. Well, Adair, I, and, and I'm going to, you know, this may be, we're getting near the end of the, the session here, uh, but coming back to some of the existential questions you put on the table at the very beginning on, on how we look at it. I would tell you from a U.S. perspective that we are on the edge, I think, of some nasty, racist, jingoistic nationalism. Uh, as you said, there's bipartisan, as it's been said earlier, there's bipartisanship wrapped up uh, in in posturing in a very anti-China way. And I've been waiting for a smart strategy that America might do. A lot has come up about Huawei, but you know we're, we're not doing much on the Huawei front. Nokia and Ericsson and Samsung don't have big economic arms behind them to present them as alternatives. The US does not have a champion. It's just posturing and bluster. And that can sometimes have very uh, racist impacts. And, and particularly, and I'll just put my perspective on, you know, I sometimes worry about the demonization of any company or any player beyond this. And I just wonder if it's become a placeholder, whereas we should be debating, in my view, China's national intelligence law, its national security law, and what it subjects companies in China to do, just like we should be looking at those laws as they apply to U.S. technology companies in Silicon Valley with regard to the CIA and the FBI, which, which is missing in this discussion. But I just want to kind of ask you in this you know, last opportunity in framing this, again, looking at all the things we've heard about pathways forward that are constructive and productive, but not naive and, and wonder what your thoughts are. There is a session here, uh, and I, I don't think it was meant facetiously, a question that says, in the last session, there was that um, discussion of sending the brightest minds from China, the US on a spa retreat to come up with anything. It sounds like Bretton Woods. You know, Would a Bretton Woods in the US-China G2 game have any value from your perspective? Uh, you're muted, Adair. That's a very wide set of questions, Steve. Yeah. Um, look, clearly, it is the responsibility of politicians, but some politicians are irresponsible, to stop legitimate, perhaps, concerns about particular national security issues or disagreements about um, different uh, internal policies to spill over into the demonization uh, of the other uh, as right. being an inherent threat or as being, you know, just fundamentally different and therefore unable to get on with. And right. I mean, that's that is sometimes racist, it, it, though there's a there's a complication here that sometimes I don't think these statements are, are, are racist in the sense of uh, I, 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 attaching to people of Chinese ethnicity, because the statements often clearly exclude from them uh, people right. of Chinese ethnicity in America who happen to ad agree with you. Um, I think there is, however, something which is not quite racism, but it's a demonization of, of a culture or a civilization. Mm. And I think there is in the West a dismissiveness of, of, of China, um, which fades over from legitimate areas of disagreement and criticism and concern into this wider uh, attack on China and a failure to, uh, you know, respect China. Right. And right. I think, I guess one of the things I would plead for is good history on both mm. sides. I think reading each other's history in a right. really good and open fashion is one of the best things that uh, we should uh, we should try and do, and that might create a more subtle discourse. 
Well, that's that's a terrific way to end this session. I'll say I'll go back to Rob Johnson's first insightful comment on the woundedness uh, uh, on both sides in this relationship, how to heal and address that woundedness and those histories people left behind. China feeling uh, with a with a world of humiliation uh, uh, in its own sense of history and, and identity. Uh, but I think that's happened to a lot of Americans as well. So I don't think we've solved the problem yet, but I do think we've had a very rich discussion laying out a lot of the foundation of what needs to, to be achieved. So I want to thank um, our panel, um, very excellent panel. We have Justin Yifu Lin, uh, Dean uh, at Peking University, Danny Roderick uh, from Harvard and the President of the International Economic Association, Michael Spence, Nobel Laureate, Smart and so many things, uh, and Adair Turner, Chair of the Energy Transitions Committee, former chairman uh, as well of INET. Thank you all so much. And now I'm going to, this, this ends our summit on US-China relations uh, and, and climate. And now I'd like to bring to the stage uh, our very own Rob Johnson, INET President, Andrew Sheng, whom we heard from before, distinguished fellow at the Asia Global Institute for some final thoughts on this overall summit. Rob, over to you. <clears throat> Hopefully Rob is there to be. Yeah. Let's see. There we are. Okay. Can you hear me? A little yes. bit of a delay. Well, first of all, I want to thank all of our panelists and Jillian and Steve Clements for the vitality and the curiosity and the imagination that you've all brought to bear today. Uh, I guess as a doctor's son, my propensity is to create a narrative that starts with diagnosis but ends with prescribed remedies. And I thought this last panel would have... Uh, would have made my father smile. Uh, there are lots of things that are difficult. Uh, I thought it was very valuable today to have Justin's perspective on who China wants to be. Uh, as always, Danny and Mike, you uh, are leaders just like you are in our Global Commission on Economic Transformation. And I believe this US-China interface is a very, very important next dimension. Uh, is Andrew on, uh, Andrew Sheng, is he? It does not seem to be here, so it's all you, Rob. Oh, okay. Well, I wanted, because Andrew, going all the way back to the beginning of INET, has been a very, very formidable contributor, I wanted to ask him to make the final remarks as he lives and wrestles with these challenges every day. So I guess we can finish by, I'll say thank you to Andrew and thank you to all of you uh, on all three panels. I believe this is the beginning of an exploration. I don't believe this is the end of it, but the quality of minds that came to this table is in itself quite encouraging. And uh, I'm, I'm very, very grateful for the way in which you've all supported this enormous challenge and supported INET on this day. Thank you, Rob. And I'm just going to share with our audience too as well that if you're interested in seeing past INET events or going back and sharing uh, these discussions, and I have to say each panel was very different. I had the privilege of doing the first one. Jillian Ted of the Financial Times moderated the second with an extraordinary discussion and our third very a rich discussion as well. These will all uh, be available, these climate debates on the um, INET events website. And to hear about new webinars and upcoming events, follow INET live at, at INET Economics on social media. See you next time. Thank you all very much and goodbye. <laughs>